Direct from the Broski Nation headquarters in Los Angeles, California, this is the Broski Report with your host, Brittany Broski. Hey guys, welcome back to the Broski Report. It's me, Broski. Or as my friend Taylor, my best friend Taylor likes to call me, Boski. And something that she developed over the past weekend was Little Bobo. Hey, Bobo? You can hear the yard guys. Hey, y'all. My uh, yard guys are here. Love them to goddamn death. But I am going to keep recording. So if you hear the yard guys, just suck it up. All right? Just grow up. All right? Life happens. What's that? Remember those baby bibs they used to make that instead of shit happens, they would say spit happens. And that is so true. Sometimes you're just a baby in a high top chair and life is spoon feeding you shit and you're vomiting and you're like, I can't take anymore. And then they keep putting it. like that scene in the uh, Grinch when it's the baby Grinch and they keep feeding him stuff. That's literally me. That's me in the high top high chair of life. And life keeps force feeding me food. And I'm like, I don't know. And then they're like, no, no. That's me. Spit happens, guys. Spit happens. So anyway, yeah, the yard guys are working and I'm going to let them do their thing. I'm not going to go out there and be that lady that's like, wait, y'all mind cutting that out? I got to record something on my phone. I'm not going to be that that white woman that stands out there like, y'all are being a little too loud. They're just doing their jobs. They're doing what I pay them to do. I'm not going to go out there and yell. Me like, we don't mind. They're good. And you guys can grow up. Okay? So something that I sort of punctuated the last episode with was this promised debate and discussion about... Is art self-serving? So if y'all aren't ready to strap in and get philosophical and academic and put your minds in a place of of solitude and navel-gazing and self-reflection and maybe a larger macroscopic reflection, then I don't know what to tell you, okay? If you're not ready for that, get ready. Everyone, get ready. I don't get ready. I stay ready. I don't get gorgeous. I stay gorgeous. (laughs) So I've also moved my laptop positioning over here, by the way, because I noticed because for the life of me, I could not get this camera one because once again, guys, it's me in this room. No one is in this room with me. It's me. I've got a key light. I've got two little fill lights and I've got two cameras and I've got a screen recording. It's me, dude. No one's here checking the levels. It's me. I've got my little table over here. I got my rickety little table with all my equipment. Okay? Because anything you can do, I can do better. And that may be a lie. But I'm going to try. I'm going to try to do it myself. Because I can. I can run a podcast by myself. Look, Kylo Ren agrees. I love Kylo Ren. I need him to suck me. Okay. (laughs) Oh, so now there's helicopters overhead. (laughs) What the fuck is happening? Come on, I'm being swatted. I'm being swarmed. They do not want me to record this episode, but guess what? God did. God did. They don't want to see you win. They don't want to see you record podcasts of the Broski Report. But God did. I call her chandelier. I call her Broski. Stupid. (laughs) <laughs> the way that it's all around. I hear the noise all around. I'm so sorry, guys. But nevertheless, we prevail. We 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 uh we are marching on. Okay, what was I just about to say? Oh, I need you guys to sort of go there with me. Okay, I I need you to lock in on what I'm about to talk about and uh kind of open your mind because this is quite frankly, a meaningless discussion, but it means something to me. And, and it's this classic debate of is art meaningless or, or meaningful. And is some art like fucking Andy Warhol's soup cans, is that just stupid? And he did it cause he could do it. Or does it have a deeper and uh, more sentimental philosophical meaning? So that's kind of what we're going to solve here today. So hope you guys are ready for that. Oh, I was saying, uh, the camera, <laughs> the, hopefully the focus is now on me and the lighting is a bit better because I noticed that this camera one was focusing on, 
all my stickers on my laptop instead of on my beautiful face. On my beautiful, sculpted, natural face. Okay? So, hopefully we fix that. Um, we got the Star Wars Funko Pops. We've got the Mickey phone with the nuke codes. And we're, we're uh, cooking with peanut oil, guys. So, we're going to jump into it. Is art self-serving? Okay? A thesis by Brittany Boski. I, okay, here's one side. Making art for yourself is selfish. Making it for others is pandering. Okay? That's the two sides. Making art for yourself is selfish. It's self-indulging. It's what you want to make. Now making art for other people is pandering, one could argue. Okay, so what's also coupled with this debate, if those are the two sides, is is there a world where art is not all-consuming and detrimental to the artist. Because when you think about true art in this sort of vacuum, when you think about someone who is known as their career for being an artist or an author or a, or a musician, you know what I mean? Where your entire life is dedicated to your craft. That possibility is really going out the door with late stage capitalism, and with where we're at today as a society where gas is seven fucking dollars and no one can afford rent and the earth is on fire. I don't think that there is an ethical way to devote your whole life to art unless that art is platforming the issues that plague the world today. And there are a select few artists who do this and who do it successfully. And it is a duty and a responsibility that those artists have to sing about shit that matters. Hosier is, of course, the number one person that I'm thinking of right now. Hosier, I've talked about this so many times before, I want to do a separate episode on him, but singing about the ban on women's autonomy, on, on abortion rights, on Black Lives Matter, on gay rights, on trans rights, on all of these things, on... on he had an interview series on Spotify, dude. He had a podcast that he hosted for a short little while where he interviewed uh, famous activists. And one of the people that he really highlighted was someone who had endured years of abuse uh, at the hands of the church, which is not uncommon in Ireland and the UK. Um, he, he platforms these people who have a story to share and not only a story to share but a story that so many people can relate to and it's harrowing and it's sorrowful but it's full of hope and it's full of this idea that if you talk about it and you spread what's happening in your own country you can stop it because hope dies in the darkness so if you give light to it if you give it a fucking podcast mic it can be talked about and it can be fixed, hopefully, is sort of the sentiment there. I think, you know, you can sing about love, you can sing about friendship, you can sing about death or whatever sort of is, is on your mind. But at the core of it, I have the utmost respect for artists that dedicate their platform and their time and their creative energy to things that fucking matter. That matter. That you can assign almost this unofficial anthem to the, these things that matter. So I, I think that is, is the musical side of art. In that sense, I don't think it's self-serving. Now, who's getting paid to make that music? Of course, the artist. So in that sense, it is a little self-serving. But it's up to you what you do with that money, you know? Now, when it comes to physical art making, prints and paintings and, and sculptures, whatever, what, what have you, is that self-serving? I think the answer is yes! 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 But with the answer yes, you can also have this understanding that it is larger than you. When Picasso made Guernica, Guernica stands as a symbol for a lot of things. But if, if you don't know, I've talked about Guernica on uh, some of my YouTube videos when I do art history videos. This is Guernica by Pablo Picasso. And this was a painting that was made after a German bombing of the civilian town of Guernica in Spain. 
and uh, it was just a, a an attack. It, this town was full of civilians, women and children, and it was a German air raid, destroyed the town. And it was for no reason, and it was senseless violence, and it's a tragedy by all accounts. Picasso made this in his style, of course, which is this sort of abstract, surrealist interpretation and portrayal of the events that happened in Guernica. And this is uh, in between, I think this was like 1936 that the bombing happened? 1937. This is a, a direct sort of historical portrayal of the after effects of modern warfare at the time. Um, this sort of pre-World War II occurrence. And so you have this and for Picasso, of course, this was top of his mind. He wanted to paint this. He wanted to paint the faces of the mothers who had lost their children, holding their dead children in their arms. And he wanted to paint the destruction and the violence and the terror on not only the humans' faces, but the, the animals' faces, the horses, the cattle who are writhing in pain, who are screaming towards the sky, who are reaching for any form of light, the soldiers who have are dead on the floor who have flower petals in their guns, in, in the barrels of their guns. It's like all of this is, there's so many messages. <clears throat> I could write a, an entire essay on the significance of Guernica, but at the end of the day, was it self-serving in the process of creating that art, of creating this piece, to sort of get out his own emotions, to express what he was mourning and lamenting in in putting this on the canvas you know and i think that 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 is the most interesting question is that it can be serving a larger purpose of look at what they're doing look at what they're doing since no one's talking about it i will paint it i will show it to you i will show you the devastation of what these bombings are doing to these people these aren't just ships on a map. These aren't just populations on a map. These are real human lives that did nothing. They were civilian. They're not involved. So in that sense, it carries a larger purpose and a larger uh, ripple effect of meaning. So in that sense, maybe art is not self-serving. And the fact that almost 100 years later, we're still talking about Granica as if it's happening today. You know, as if, as if it's a recent occurrence, which in a certain uh, uh, sense, I guess it is. I also want to talk about how when it comes to artists, both print mediums, music, authors, directors, whatever it is, when you have dedicated your life to making art, if you have the privilege of dedicating your life to making the art you want to make, how it almost always it feels like ends in tragedy. The number one example would be probably the 27 Club, which if you don't know about the 27 Club, it's a group of famous musicians who have all died at the age of 27. The 27 Club involves the following. Kurt Cobain, Brian Jones of the Rolling Stones, Jim Morrison, Amy Winehouse, Robert Johnson, Janis Joplin, Jimi Hendrix, and more. I think that... That, for some reason in my mind, that's always been coupled with like they've been found with white lighters in their pockets. The white lighter curse or white lighter myth is an urban legend based on the 27 Club in which it is claimed several musicians and artists died while in possession of a white disposable cigarette lighter, leading such items to come to become associated with bad fortune. I think that's crazy. I've always thought that like whenever I've been at a club or I've been anywhere and someone pulls out a white lighter to smoke a cigarette or something, I like go inside. I like don't want to be around you. I don't know. I do think that it has bad fortune. And Post Malone a few years ago came out with merch that was white lighters. And I was like, hate that. I do hate that because even though I may be skeptical, skeptical about ghosts and paranormal things, I'm not a fucking idiot and I'm not going to dick with it. So if there is... A, a supernatural myth around something just don't do it i also am, I, maybe i just have ocd because i don't walk under ladders i don't fuck with black cats i don't put my cowboy hats or any hats on a bed that's really bad luck never put a hat on a bed i think that there is some um 
I always knock on wood. Like, I think that there's some validity to, like, humans are a very interesting species of creature. I think that if we've managed to make some connections like that, like connecting the dots in a certain sense, that that's interesting, right? Like, maybe we should listen to each other. Thanks to the sponsor of today's episode, Blissy. If y'all have never tried a silk pillowcase, baby, listen to me. Listen to me real quick. I got to put you on to Blissy's award-winning 100% mulberry silk pillowcases. Silk is honestly the best way to sleep during the summertime. Blissy silk pillowcases are temperature regulating and have naturally insulating properties. So if you sweat and overheat while you sleep, Blissy is for you. It stays cool throughout the night so that you're not constantly waking up sweating around your neck or flipping the pillow over to the cool side. And on top of that, it's so good for hair. It reduces frizz, tangles, and prevents hair breakage. And I can personally attest to this because I sweat like a mofo. And it protects my hair the way that old cotton pillowcases used to kind of tear it up. Silk keeps the moisture in your hair and keeps your skincare products and natural moisture on your skin because silk does not absorb the moisture off your face. There's a lot of dupes out there that claim satin can be an alternative to silk, but that's not the case. Satin is made from synthetic fibers like polyester, while silk is a luxurious all-natural fiber. And because it's synthetic, it also traps heat and moisture. So if you run warm, it pools that sweat and heat around your face while you sleep. Silk is more breathable, moisture wicking, and gentle. It's also more durable and long lasting. So think of it like an investment in getting better sleep and waking up ready to take on the day. It's also a great gift to give someone. I mean, everyone needs a pillowcase and these zip, okay? Blissy silk pillowcases are the best silk pillowcases on the market. They have a ton of different prints and colors and they make great gifts because there's an option for anyone. They have over 1.5 million raving fans and you could be next. So try now risk-free for 60 nights at blissy.com slash broski and get an additional 30% off. That's B-L-I-S-S-Y dot com slash broski and use code broski to get an additional 30% off. Sleep cooler this summer with Blissy. Okay, so the question of is the art always detrimental to the artist or rather is the environment that the artist is thrust into this like all paparazzi, all up in your business, like media frenzy that happens when you're a very famous celebrity. Is that to blame for how the art becomes detrimental to the artist or is the person to blame? And is it a little bit of both? And is it tapping into at our core, humans are both incredibly strong and we can endure a lot, but also we're very weak and we succumb to our fixations and our temptations and our compulsions. So I don't know. I think in an interesting case study that I'm kind of, I've recently become obsessed with is Ernest Hemingway. Now, I know some of you bitches just rolled your eyes because it's like, Ernest Hemingway, what are we in English class? Have you ever considered that learning is magical and beautiful and maybe you should do it more? Have you considered that learning is one of the few precious gifts of life is that we are always learning? And maybe if you listened, you could learn a lot. Are we in English class? I'm going to shoot you. (laughs) Are we in English? When is lunch? There's a bomb. (laughs) There's a bomb threat in Broski Nation. (laughs) Then <laughs> I planted it. <laughs> Stupid. Not funny. Not funny, by the way. Stupid. Okay. Ernest Hemingway. Yes, we're in English class, you, you bitch. So, like I always say, if you're driving, take your hands off the wheel. Close your eyes. Jerk your steering wheel into the other oncoming traffic. It's time to let go and to learn. Ernest Hemingway was, let's actually, let's pull up the Wikipedia team. Ernest Hemingway was an American novelist, short story writer, and journalist. His economical and understated style, which included his iceberg theory, had a strong influence on 20th century fiction, while his adventurous lifestyle and public image brought him admiration from later generations. This dude was born in 1899. He fought in World War I. Uh, and then died in 1961 of suicide. 
Um, very sad. He was a very, very troubled, plagued person. And it was one of those things where he sustained multiple injuries, multiple brain injuries over the course of his entire life. And I don't mean just like, oh, he knocked his head on on a, a, a door frame or something like that. Like he was in multiple plane crashes, multiple car crashes, like fell off a of shit, bonked his head, stitches, concussions constantly, probably like six or seven throughout his whole life. And mental health care at the time when he was alive, which was, you know, he was in his adulthood, 1940s to 1960s, mental health care was non-existent. You know, this is, they're still electroshocking people. Like homosexuality was considered as a disease, a diagnosable mental illness. So contextually and like societally, we were in a very different place in the 60s, obviously, than today. So when you consider that, and when you consider that a lot of the symptoms that Ernest Hemingway had um, are very easily recognizable today as depression and anxiety and, uh, I don't know, brain trauma. You start to realize how much he probably was going through with little to no sympathy, you know? And it's almost this frustration from the people around him of like, just get better. Like, you're not sick, just get better. And there was no empathy or, or, or sympathy for this is something so chemical and internal that, you know, can't, can't really be fixed. Um, and, and eventually, you know, he did succumb to those compulsions. Um, but you know, I, I, how tragic is it that for what a lot of people consider to be one of the most important and greatest writers of the 20th century, both in how he the simplistic way in which he wrote these stories, but also the subject matter that he tackled and, and uh, farewell to arms is I'm currently reading it, which is about his, it's based on his experience in Italy during world war one. And uh, just how fucking ass backwards wartime is, you know, like he's written some really incredible time capsules of the human experience in the early 20th century. And it's just, it's always a shame when these artists, who are on the brink of excellence or have achieved, you know, eternal excellence, they're taken from us and at their own hand is just, it's such a, it's such a tragedy. And, but on all accounts, you know, for their families, but also for them to have that much genius and intelligence and creativity crammed into that skull and then just be so fucking miserable is like, I mean, it's the Robin Williams effect of you spend your whole life creating, creating and creating and creating for other people and making other people happy and making other people laugh. But like, who gives a fuck about you? You know, just, okay. And if you're not okay, we need to get you back to a place, the quick rehab pills, whatever it is. So you can start making people happy again and start making people money again. And through this process of how art has become commodified and art has become a thing to sell and to buy instead of a thing to be enjoyed and to be created and to enjoy the process of creation and the process of enjoying what's been created. It's, it's so backwards and it just makes me sad. But the thing about Hemingway was, I mean, a lot of people critics and and other authors other like heralded authors have said that he is just as important to like english literature and the history of english literature as shakespeare that's crazy like that's crazy and like i said they didn't know how to treat you know bpd or depression or anything any of these things back in the 50s so they literally electro shocked him they used electro convulsive therapy on him to sort of shake things back to where they needed to be. And after they did this a few times, I mean, it was just the beginning of the end for him. Like he already wasn't doing well. And then it was just like, I, I think that I, as my professional medical opinion, I think that these rounds of electroconvulsive therapy killed him. They killed him in the end. They robbed him of his gift, which is so sad to think about. Robbed him of his ability to hear and see and read and write which is what he was put on this planet to do he could no longer do i completely understand giving up you know and as sad as it is i just i, I get it i'm also not saying that ernest hemingway was a saint by any means but 
the legacy of his art and his cultural impact is a discussion to be had. This episode is sponsored by Base. I know some of us are cursed with the overpacking gene, trying to fit everything we think we might need for a trip, only to end up with a suitcase bursting at the seams. With Base, there's room for everything. 15 pairs of underwear for a weekend trip? No problem. And trust me, I'm going to use every single pair. Deciding between a few pairs of shoes? Bring them all with Base. Base was created by actress Shay Mitchell to make sleek and affordable bags, luggage, and accessories designed to help you travel effortlessly while still looking fashionable. Base has thought of everything you could ever want in a piece of luggage. 360 degree gliding wheels, a cushioned handle, built-in weight indicator, washable bags for your dirty clothes, and all the interior pockets you need to keep organized. Their luggage comes in multiple sizes and colors, and for shorter trips, the Weekender bag is super functional and even has a place to store your shoes separately. I take this all the time. It fits perfectly in the overhead bin, even under the seat in front of you. It's so nice for air travel. Every piece is made to look better with miles, so you don't have to worry about it in cargo or overhead. Base has over 30,000 five-star reviews. So whether you're packing for a quick trip or looking to breeze through the security line, Base has your personal items covered. Right now, Base is offering my listeners 15% off their first purchase by visiting basetravel.com slash broski. Go to basetravel.com slash broski for 15% off your first purchase. That's B-E-I-S travel.com slash broski. Now, here is another question that I find very interesting. Is all of that chaos necessary to make truly plugged in art? Do you have to be in the thick of it to make really, really plugged in and impactful art? Or can you kind of be on the fringes of, of society on, uh, can you be on the fringes of civilization, so to speak? Like, I mean, Goya is a different example of Goya. Francisco Goya was towards the end of his life in a similar sort of physical state where he had gone deaf he was going blind. He was losing his mind. He was in his early 70s and he removed himself from society after years of being a court painter and doing commissions. He removed himself because he was so disgusted with the state of Spain around the time of the Spanish Inquisition. And he lived in a country house at the end of his life alone, away from everyone, away from civilization, away from it. And that was when some of the darkest paintings of his life came out and there were, was no one there to sell them, to celebrate them, to put them in exhibitions, to do anything. They just were around his house. He would paint just to paint and then he would take it off of the easel and put it against the wall and then he would start on another one. I think I just got to chill. Maybe I think that is the most beautiful thing is he had to create period. There was no out for him. There was no glamour and, and glitz and success of, I just need to finish this, pump it out, sell it. And, you know, I can, of socializing with the most important people of the time and getting in the room with this and so No, no, no. It's making art because he had to, dude. That was his life's purpose and goal. And if he didn't do that, it's like when a shark stops swimming, they fucking die. If he didn't do that, he would have died earlier than he did. That's one end of the spectrum. The other end of the spectrum is this like Amy Winehouse frenzy that the media puts on an artist where you see someone with a skill, an extraordinary skill, and they're young and they're impressionable and they have a joy and an innocence around them for creating said art. And then that's when the media latches on. Adele has always said, like, she's never forgotten what the media did to Amy Winehouse. And I, it's just so true. It happens time and time and time again. There is a reason that all of these fucking people, all of these S-tier celebrities who have left their impact on culture and were taken from us too soon due to overdose, substance abuse, suicide, they can't fucking take it. And it's because of the media. 
It's because of the media and the industry and the people that are playing puppets with all of these young creatives. It's, it's, it's a sickness that is unfortunate in Hollywood. And I'm not even in that sort of social setting, but I see the effects of it. I've been in rooms with people, people who I have looked up to, like creators who I grew up watching. And I've watched them sit there and like, and I don't mean to sound like a, a narc when I say this, but it is upsetting when you see this person that has brought you so much joy, just kind of having a disrespect and lack of care for their own life. You know, doing things, putting things under their body, ingesting things, hanging out with people, putting themselves in situations that are dangerous and and upsetting. It's just like, what is it about this fucking devil city of Hollywood that makes people do that? People get obsessed with it and it, it becomes this lifestyle that is hard to keep up with unless you're on something. And it was a it was a weird sort of, I don't know, I, I had a moment with my dad before I moved out to LA because he kind of warned me about the comedy scene, which it's outdated advice, but I appreciate it nonetheless of, you know, the comedy scene of the late 80s, early 90s of like John Belushi and all of these famous like the, the SNL cast at the time where it's just understood and assumed that everyone in the comedy scene is on Coke and Coke is by no means the worst drug that people are on, you know, in the entertainment industry, but it's very common. I mean, Coke is, it's like ibuprofen out here. Everyone's on fucking Coke. Everyone's on Coke and ketamine. And when I realized that for the first time, I was like, cause I grew up with such strict Christian parents like I did not, I have n never seen a nugget of weed until I was probably 21, like genuinely. And to go from that to this environment out here, that's just like, if you're not on it, if you don't do that, you're, you're the odd one out. And again, I don't want to sound like a fucking narc, but it's true. And it's dangerous because people don't know when to stop. I understand it's Hollywood and it's a recreational sort of everyone does it and it makes you feel good and it helps you escape from probably how fucking weird it is to be a celebrity or to have a following or to be famous in any sense. Like it's a very, I don't think that people were meant to be observed and perceived on that scale. It is not something that you can grapple with easily. Like I'll admit that. And, and, of course, this conversation is separate from the conversation of, of course, I love what I do and celebrities probably love what they do. And it's a, such a privileged position to be in. But that can be true at the same time that this is a very odd and unusual thing to have happen to you. And on a human level, you know, going from being normal and doing a normal job and doing whatever to suddenly having the ear of millions and millions and millions of people. And now what you say is forever recorded in the history of forever is crazy. So I understand how people lose their fucking minds. I understand, dude, don't get me wrong. And I understand if you need a little pick me up or if you need a little liquid courage to kind of do your job, trust and believe, I understand. But it's so, 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 so heavily intertwined with the media and the media frenzy that they go on like fucking piranhas on a young, successful person who's in the limelight, who has a controversy or their love life or, you know, just any anything. It's like when you take a step back and zoom out of this celebrity culture we live in. And you zoom out and you see these, when you don't focus on the celebrity, but you focus on the publications and the people taking the photos and the people green lighting these articles and videos to go up, that's where the fucking plague is, bitch. And it's interesting and it's morbid curiosity. And of course we love it. Everyone loves a celebrity gossip. Everyone look because it's not your own life. It's escapism. But those people are real people too. And I never, ever gave a fuck about that. Like before I did this job, obviously, because why would you? These, these aren't real people. I'm probably not a real person to some of y'all. You know, like I'm a little, a little figure you watch on your phone. I'm a little person that you turn on in the background, but it's this existential spiral that I found myself in of like, I used to feel that way about people. And now I'm in a position where people feel that way around me. And I don't really know what to make of it. Honestly, is my conclusion. I don't know what to make of it. 
Um, I can be very, very grateful, which I am, of course. But I'm human enough to also admit that this shit's weird, dude. It's weird. And I find myself giving these people who fuck up in the limelight uh, more grace. Because no one prepares you for this. There's no, there's no how to. You kind of learn from other people's mistakes and your own. It's just a very strange thing. But what they do to people like Amy Winehouse and Whitney Houston and Prince and Marilyn Monroe and Elvis and all of these people who are just icons, icons. And they were taken, you know, and, and, and what pushed them to that point? They were all on substance. It's just very sad. Okay. Do I have anything else to say on the art discussion? I think that's it. I think that art, I don't really know what my conclusion is, but if someone wants to type it out in the comments and kind of summarize what I was saying, I'd appreciate that. <laughs> so that I can have a, a concise conclusion for my thesis. But that is, there are just so many layers and levels of nuance to the discussion. I don't think that there is a yes or no answer to is art self-serving. I think for some people it is, for some people it's not, for some people it's therapeutic, for some people it's a job. But I think that the real enemy and all of it, the art discussion aside, is that what the media does with the artist, how the media treats the artist, and how the media disrespects the art by focusing on the artist, period. That's that's my conclusion. This episode is sponsored by Tinder. Guys, uncuffing season is here. It's the end of summer. It's the best time to be single, have fun, and make some unforgettable memories. And Tinder is here to help you find the perfect partner for those moments. Success on Tinder can mean whatever you want it to. And it starts with a swipe. There are so many possibilities that are just a match away. Tinder's the most popular dating app in the world that means the most opportunity to find whatever it is you're looking for over 1.5 million tinder users go on an in real life date every week and tinder has more safety features than any other dating app also tinder just released relationship goals a new status for your profile that shows others what type of connection you're really looking for relationship goals is just one of many features that tinder has released to make sure you're comfy on the app other apps are hard Tinder is easy and fun. So on Tinder, it starts with a swipe. Download Tinder today and explore all the possibilities for yourself. To completely pivot, to completely change sides, we're going to be talking about TikTok whimper audios. <laughs> and we're going to be listening to some. <laughs> One moment. Oh, here we go. We got it. We got it. We got it. We have liftoff team. We have fucking liftoff. I found the video. I found the video, dude. Okay. 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 Here's the thing. I'm going to give a little crash course for the bitches that aren't weird. Okay. If you're listening to this podcast, you're a level of weird. Admit that. But for the bitches that aren't weird like me, let me sort of explain this and put it in context and um, really almost kind of convince myself how weird it is. So from the beginning, I've always said like women don't want to see dick pics. Okay. That's a, we don't want to see it. It, a dick doesn't turn us on. You know what I want to see? Neck veins. I want to see a neck vein. I want to see hands. I want to see your forearms, dude. You got them veiny ass forearms. You're a slut. You got a slutty little waist and some veiny forearms. You're a whore. I want to see that. Yeah, yeah. Put that on the, yeah. That's what I want to see, dude. I don't want to. And no, eh, no more dick pics. Eh, dick pics outlawed in Broski Nation. You can only, if you want to work at a Broski Nation strip club or an NSFW club, you're going to have to submit some photos of your neck. <laughs> and what's this little piece of meat right here that connects your neck to your shoulders? I want to see some of that. Yup. And then I want to see some, yup, that slutty little waist. I got to see your thighs. That's what I'm not trying to do all of that. Okay. No one gives a fuck about your dick pic. Put it away. If I see it, I'm taking your phone. If I see it, I'm taking it. Okay? And you can get it back after class. I don't want to see it again. <laughs> if you're sending dick pics, I'm taking it and you don't get it back until after class. 
Okay? You can pick it up in the principal's office. We don't do that here. You don't bring that to school. Anyway. That's what people don't understand. Okay? Men don't understand that. We don't want to see those parts. We want to see other parts. The female gaze is what I'm describing. Okay? With that being said, that's a little priming. That's a little primer for what we're about to get into on this Christian website, TikTok.com. TikTok.gov. There is a trend on TikTok to... (laughs) There's a trend on TikTok to ask men how many push-ups they can do. To say like, I bet you can't do 50 push-ups with the phone on the floor. I bet you can't do that. And of course, because they're men and they're fucking stupid. They're like, yeah, I can. Oh, basically, yeah, I can. And so they'll do it because they're idiots. You fell for it, you dumbass. So they set up their phone so it looks like they're doing a push-up on top of you. And guess what, bitch? We get whimper audios because they're whimpering. And that's what the girls, there's a whole community on TikTok, what I'm trying to get at, that they listen to men whimpering and there are NSFW audios that people make. And it's like, these are the only fans that women are subscribing to. It's, it's sexy audios of like a cute boyfriend ASMR or like, like, uh, <laughs> what is it called? angry British boyfriend ASMR. There are so many YouTube channels and like Reddit threads and all this shit of people. These men who will literally buy a podcast mic and record themselves doing NSFW like, oh yeah, like audios and then sell access to it and people buy it. And I've thought about it. I've considered it. Because I'm a sicko. I'm a sicko. <laughs> Lock me up, officer. (laughs) I don't care. If you put it on the internet, I will find it. You put it on God's green earth, I'm going to find it if it's a boyfriend whimper audio. (laughs) I'm going to find it. Okay, before I launch into this, I need you to understand... I'm still in my Call of Duty era, all right? I'm still reading fan fictions. I'm still watching videos. I found a new guy who goes live as Ghost from Call of Duty, and his name's Daniel, okay? And he's on TikTok, and you can look him up. Daniel Ghost Cosplayer, and he's hot, okay? There's another one called Ghost, G-H-O-E-S-T. He makes me actually want to commit violence. Like, I, I need to commit a heinous crime. After I watch one of his videos, like I, I'm like, I need to be locked in a cage with a fucking muzzle. <clears throat> it's terrible. And I'm out here bearing my soul to you guys in the hopes that I will find community with at least one person. And if I'm not finding community, you guys need to get in on this community because I'm sick and tired of feeling alone. I'm sick and tired of doing this by myself. I really need y'all to like meet me halfway. Meet me halfway. Damn, where is Fergie? Fergie would not like these Call of Duty men. I'll tell you that right now. Okay. So before further ado, or without further ado, let's watch this. Like he knows this! He knows this! He knows Longer version. <laughs> longer, longer version. <laughs> like cave women. Me want longer version. <laughs> ah, they're so thirsty. Yeah, yeah. Longer whimper audio. I can comment all day long. Oh my god. <sighs> Oh, <laughs> longer. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry about who I just was. 
I'm I'm sorry about who I just became for a second. That was not cool. That that was actually really not okay, guys. I'm, I, is everyone okay? Is everyone all right? Are y'all mad at me? Is everyone okay? Do we do we need to take a water break? <laughs> that was fucking crazy. And we're gonna watch it again. <laughs> Fuck you, I don't care. It's my podcast. We're watching it again. Fine. That's crazy! That is crazy. He, Y'all got this man to dress up in cosplay from a video game and grunt while doing push-ups so people can simulate like they're like they're boinking him so they can simulate like they're boinking him dude where do we go wrong as a society this is so tumblr coded like that is so tumblr where those gifts they used to make gifts of like one direction on stage like humping the air to a song and they would like flip it horizontal and like it was like an art form dude any crumbs any crumbs god and now we get this for free <laughs> i'm 26 26 is the new 23 though okay bitch and 30 is the new 25 so shut up i'm not afraid of getting old I pay my taxes on time, bitch. If I want to listen to men on TikTok whimper, I'm going to do it. Because I pay for this Wi-Fi. <laughs> I pay for my own goddamn Wi-Fi. I'm going to watch what I want. My bills are paid, babe. What else do I got on here? Okay, this is, this is like a bit much. <laughs> okay, so if you're an audio listener, I'll describe what's happening afterward. But if you're a video listener, I'm sorry. <laughs> Don't, 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 don't. I can't even finish it. That's about to piss me off. Oh, and I liked it. What the fuck is wrong with me? Okay, it's a Call of Duty cosplayer. It's a Call of Duty cosplayer, and he's <laughs> he's handcuffed, and he's rolling his eyes back in his head to the beat. Like he's getting dome. Where did I go wrong? Someone needs to cut my ethernet cord. Someone needs to like permanently disable my iPhone and my laptop so I can just not do this. Because I don't even know. I can't explain this. If you put me like in a courtroom and I was on the witness stand and you pulled this up as evidence of some like fucking mental breakdown I had where I kidnapped some cosplayer and and they're citing this as evidence that like it was it was uh what's that called premeditated and they pulled this up and they said what's this I'd say ah. <laughs> I'd say ah. you got me there your honor your honor but did you see it but your honor your honor look at him he got the red led light <laughs> They'd say, what is this? This is in your TikTok likes. And I'd say, I'm just a baby. I don't know. I'm just a little baby. That's crazy. That's crazy. What if his mom saw this? What if his mother saw this? Him acting like he's getting sucked off on camera. <laughs> It's batshit crazy, dude. Oh my God. Anyway, whimper audios are a thing. And now a idea just popped into my brain that I need to react to boyfriend ASMR on YouTube. I have got to see what the girls are doing on YouTube. I may even have to buy some to really, of course, for research, for research, to ingrain myself in the community. Okay. To, to insert myself and, and ferment myself in the community. Okay. Nothing other than that. No ulterior motives. None at all. I love on the comments of boyfriend ASMR videos, people will be like, I am so fucking lonely. <laughs> Which isn't funny, but it is. 
<laughs> the comments are like, I am so fucking touch starved. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. I think that does it for me today, team. Honestly. Other than that, a uh, new Royal Court episode is out with Drew F. Wallow. Go check that out. It's my favorite episode uh, thus far. I think it, I just love Drew to goddamn death. She is so funny. We had such a good time. In the next episode, y'all are going to die. Y'all are going to die. It's someone who y'all love to see me with. And you're going to really enjoy it. And it was one of my favorites to film too. I mean, every single one is my favorite to film because I love my show. I love Royal Court. I love it to goddamn death. It is so much fun. It's everything I've ever wanted. And uh, we've got some really cool guests lined up. So other than that, subscribe to this channel and turn on the notifications. And let me know. Oh my God, y'all. I have been forgetting to do the three songs of the week. So <clears throat> let's do that right now. Well, I'm just off the top of my head. Um, and I'm going to try to remember going forward. Okay, so forgive me. I am so sorry. That was something I planned on doing and I just like never did it after the first episode or the first two episodes. Currently, favorite song is Ascensionism by Sleep Token. Also Alkaline by Sleep Token. That's always stuck in my head. Um, Saddle Tramp by Marty Robbins. And last episode I talked about country music and Marty Robbins is like an OG 50s, 60s, like cowboy gunslinger, cowboy fight sort of uh, country artist. And he's got a song called Saddle Tramp, which is my favorite one. And it's so good. Go give it a listen. It's like a good sort of uh, soundtrack to a cowboy movie sort of thing. <clears throat> Third is The Archer by Greta Van Fleet, you motherfucker. I saw them in LA and I love the new album, but it just, it hasn't been hitting for me the way that uh, Battle at Gardens Gate hit for me. Like that was, that album just changed me. Um, I love Starcatcher, but seeing the Archer live was cr crazy, crazy, crazy. Go listen to the Archer by Greta Van Fleet. Oh my God. And then the last one is uh, Texas Tea by Post Malone. I mean, obviously, okay? That one's been on repeat. Texas Tea by Posty and then Something Real by Posty. The new album, I have listened to it all the way through. Um, it is not my favorite. I will admit that. It feels a little like he's trying to fulfill an album requirement. And like the one after this, we're going to get some fucking bangers on. There are like three or four songs on this one that I like. The rest all kind of blended together. They were not standouts for me. And that's fine. Not every single album has to be like, wow, this is the best thing ever. Because I love <clears throat> Hollywood's Bleeding. Probably my favorite Posty album. And that's his third album, I'm pretty sure. So yeah. Texas Tea and Something Real. Also, don't ask me about the Hosier album. I didn't mention it. I can't talk about it. It, I, I honest to God, you want my honest to God truth? I have not listened to it because I can't. Some of you will get this and some of you won't. When I, when you love something so much, you almost like don't want to see it because it makes you sad. When you love something so much, it's like, I, I didn't watch uh, Pedro on Hot Ones for honestly like a month because I love him so much I couldn't intake new Pedro content because it would make me sad because I love him so much and I really don't know how to put it into words other than that and so I feel that way about Hosier I've been waiting honest to God since 2019 that's when Wasteland Baby came out I've been waiting for that long like all the other Hosier fans for this new piece of art and he's been dropping the singles and they've just been not a single one has flopped like every single single that he has released has been one-upping itself and it's a perfectly contained cinematic universe within each song and I just am not ready to experience that on a wider scale on, on, under the whole album so I just need to like when it came out I was with friends and that was my excuse I was like oh I need to listen to it alone with headphones whatever now I'm home and I'm like I can't I still can't listen to it I just love him I love him so much I can't. <laughs> so hope this helps. 
I will listen to it eventually and I'll come back on here and I'll give my ranking and I'll give my thoughts and I'll give my sort of academic dissection of the lyrics and the production and the concept. But as of right now, I'm not prepared to share that because I have not listened and I'm scared. Honestly, I'm scared. So, all right. Love you guys. And we'll see you next week. Bye-bye.